Welcome to this episode of Game of Leadership, the podcast for curious leaders. I'm Paula Eddy Wilcox, and I'm delighted to welcome our guests for the second time, where we're looking at their take on the game and leadership aspect of the podcast. Who knows what we might find out, because we all look at this differently, and it's always so interesting to see what the guests have in store for me when I turn up, because we never plan this in advance. So I hope you're as excited as me. Let's get into it and I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to this episode of Game of Leadership, the podcast for curious leaders. And I'm really delighted to welcome back Leslie Thomas for the second week um, on this episode of the podcast. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you for having me back, Paula. Really looking forward to this conversation. Oh, thank you so much. And um, just a quick reminder, Leslie Thomas is the owner and founder and director of the Money Confidence Academy. And um, I know we're going to find out a little bit more about that in your third episode. So we won't spoil that for now. But today we're going to dig into your take on game and leadership, Leslie. Now, I love this, I have to say, and I, I know I say it in my introduction um, to, to this second episode with our guests, it's one of my favourites because everybody comes at this from a completely different angle. And just when I think, because I'm nearly at 30 episodes now, I think that somebody could could bring some, you know, it'll start repeating itself. Somebody brings something different and unique once again, and it's just fabulous. So I'm, I'm dying to hear what your thoughts are around game and leadership and what those two mean together. So over to you. That's a very, very interesting question, you know, and I think I'm going to address it from the perspective of the coaching industry mm. and you know, my experiences over the last you know, two and a half years, essentially, of being in the coaching industry. And I've used this analogy before. Um, when I joined the coaching industry, I had really no idea of, you know, what I was letting myself in for. Um, and it's a little bit like going through you know, the wardrobe in Tanania. You know, there's this world going on that you didn't know, you know, was there. And for those people who've been to um, Universal Studios in Florida and have gone to the Harry Potter part of, of, of this particular theme park, you actually go through this innocuous alleyway, and unbeknown to you, it's Dagon Alley, and there's this whole Harry Potter world. And that was exactly like that for me, joining the coaching industry. You know, there was things going on that I didn't, I didn't understand. There was a whole language being utilized that I didn't know about. But there was also psychological practices that happen in mm. terms of, and this is the game element, I think. Um, it's, 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 so psychological practice going on in terms of people showing up as the best version of themselves. And that best version of themselves is not even necessarily, so I discovered, in my naivety to begin with, is not actually even a real version of them. You know, it's mm. a little bit like, you know, the swan on the surface, but the legs going hell for leather, you know, underneath. People would exaggerate the successes that they had. Mm. They would, you know, make up things with regards to their lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. And there would be a, a real gloss and veneer you know, around the success that some people wanted to purport to have. And, you know, I think I probably, to begin with, believed it was all true because mm -hmm. I had no reason to not know it wasn't true because in the world I'd, ex you know, I'd existed in before, it was very apparent, you know, who was doing well, who wasn't, you know, doing yeah. quite well. Whereas in the coaching industry, it wasn't. And I think... It can be very, very difficult for some people to be able to exist in the coaching world 
when their sense of self-confidence, self-worth is actually built up on the difference between the scale of the difference between their success and somebody else's success. Yeah. So when you are looking at your own success and measuring it against somebody else's and that person is earning or not earning, you know, millions and you're just starting out on your journey, then it can leave you feeling very, very inadequate. And there mm. are people in the coaching industry who honestly do make vast sums of money but it hasn't been made you know overnight largely uh, i do know of one person not in the uk who did make a significant amount of money in a very very short period of time but largely you know there's a, an overnight success it's taken years to achieve basically mm. and you need to be able to work out actually the importance of their journey. Is their journey truly important? Only if you want to find the evidence, only if you want to understand why they have done what they have done and how they have done it. Not to in any way use it as a benchmark of your own success. Mm -hmm. And I think that can take a lot of personal inner work to really be able to view what is going on and working out your positioning within mm -hmm. it and I think for me I found it quite hard to begin with seeing everything that was going on first of all being told it wasn't you know everything I saw you know don't take it face value and I didn't really understand why would I not take it at face value mm. then I started to experience well people will exaggerate people will lie people will have motivations that are never my motivations but once I actually started to really understand that part of this is a game part of any entrepreneurial business I think is a game you have to be seen to be successful if you are going to attract success. But the way that you do it, it's up to you. If you want to be totally disingenuous, that is your business. But if you want to sleep at night and if you want to grow as a business and if you want to really recognize where your gaps are and look at how you can fill those gaps, because I think when you move from the corporate world where everything is done in silos, so you mm. might be a salesperson, you have a marketing person, you have a product development person, you have a pricing person, you have a billing person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you move into the coaching space and you have to be all those things or the entrepreneurial space, you have to be all those things to begin with you have to suck a point has to come when you recognize but yeah how can you be good at all of them because i haven't come across one person who is great at everything great at the selling great at the marketing great at the business development great at the administration and all of that but it does take the ability to step back and to look at what is going on and to work out what part you want to play in it. And I think, you know, when I think of game of leadership and when, you know, when you bounce the name past me, etc., and I know it was Game of Thrones that, you know, came to mind for you. When I think of, you know, Game of Thrones, I almost now think of, you know, one of the lead female characters. I can't remember her name now. The lady with the blonde hair. Beautiful. Um, oh, Daenerys. Yes, her. I can kind of imagine her on top of a mountain looking down, you know, on her world, etc. you know, essentially, and working out what her next move was going to be, basically. And I think to a certain extent, you know, within the coaching world, within the entrepreneurial space, you do need to have that ability to look down at what is going on 
and to work out the moves that you want to take. And some people will make a decision that won't sit well with me. Others will make a decision and I'll think, why didn't I think of that? But I'll actually reframe it and go, oh, well, great. So they've shown me the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. They've shown me it's possible to do that. Right. How am I going to replicate the success that they've seen? I know I'm going to find out the steps that they took. And I had a conversation with somebody this afternoon when I recorded a podcast episode. Um, and he's he's a relatively young guy. He's only 30 and he's gone through ups and downs. And he basically said, I have gotten to where I've gotten to because I've been curious. I have I've identified those people that I know can make me better at doing what I do. And I've gone and asked them how they've done it. I've gone up to them and said, I want to know more about how you have got what you've got. What what have you done? And I think it's that sense of curiosity mm-hmm. and also having that emotional intelligence and the ability to reframe. I've been told by several clients, I'm the queen of the reframe. And I take that as a huge compliment because I am able to see what can be a negative, what could be a you know a damaging situation, could knock them, could knock me back, but to actually go, no, what is the learning that I can take from this? And again, this gentleman today said, he said, um, things either work out or I learn from them. So he never ever looks at anything as failure. They either work out or I learn from them. And I thought- Fantastic growth mindset, Leslie. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I thought that is how I approach things because mm. now whether that's an age thing, and it possibly is an age thing. I, I think that know. helps. Yeah. yeah. Because we have we do have the benefit, you know, of experience. Mm. But but it is also though, I think as well, having the ability to recognize that a reframe isn't an excuse. Also mm-hmm. justification is sometimes procrastination. So yeah. just because you can give yourself the justification not to do something, actually all you're doing is procrastinating. It's really digging into that decision. And I mm. think part of the game that we all play, we play it with ourselves. You mm. know, that that, com- that inner conversation that we have with our conscious self and our subconscious self very often it is a game and our subconscious will almost be saying to us i dare you go on i dare you and what our subconscious largely is is i dare you and you watch it go wrong whereas our conscious self is saying "Uh, i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna show you it's gonna work out but Mm. it takes confidence to be able to see that rather than allow your subconscious to give you the justification to either procrastinate or to not do something. And mm. I think it's when you can look at something with that that big picture view and to work out your next move, to kind of see it like you know a chess game and to think, well, if I move that piece there, what will happen? And if I move that piece there, what will happen? But to view it in a way of moving a piece, not necessarily always going to be the right decision but when it comes to my next move I'll have learned from what didn't work that time around Mm -hmm. and I will hopefully see a different result the next time by making a different decision. Yeah and I I love that analogy of the chessboard I think um, you know having that ability to okay if I move that there what will happen if I move that there what will happen that kind of scenario planning piece um, is really a great skill to have. Mm -hmm. And especially when you are one of one in your own business or one of only a few in your own business, you need to be able to see that bigger picture. And as you say, you know, we're, we're constantly playing that in a game with ourselves where we're moving those different chess pieces to, to see what the best fit is 
to get to the result that we want at the end of it. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, as you were talking earlier about um, comparing ourselves to others, you know, I always have said um, and hear others say it too, that comparisonitis piece is the thief of all joy. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to, you have choices of how you show up yeah. and balancing those choices against what you want to achieve and what it's going to take to get you there is how you play your, let me let me say it like this, your personal game of leadership. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it, it is a case of you do need to have your own personal game of leadership because I genuinely do believe we have a two-way conversation with ourselves. It's not a one-way stream of consciousness. It's a no. two-way conversation. It's not always a helpful conversation. And you have got to be honest with yourself that, there is only one person largely that ever holds us back and that's ourselves and we can we can blame other people we can blame circumstances we can feel we've been unlucky while somebody else has been lucky but no it's the action that you choose to take and Mm -hmm. taking no action is still a decision decision Yeah. yeah And, and, you know, and, and that, that, that for me, you know, is massive, massively important. And I'll often talk to clients about it's not our limiting beliefs that we ever really need be too concerned about. Because with limiting beliefs, as Nike said, you know, we can feel the fear and we can do it anyway. Yes. It's, our, it's the limiting decision that we take as a result of that limiting mm-hmm belief Mm. that is what causes the bigger problem so i think when it comes to you know kind of thinking about us our lives you know as a game that game of leadership the person that we need to first and foremost be able to influence as a leader is ourselves Mm. and once we can truly influence ourselves and understand ourselves then actually it's a lot lot easier to lead other people because not everybody has that ability to understand that they are the leader of themselves that they need to be fully responsible for everything that goes on in their lives certain things will happen absolutely but it's how you respond to that not how you react it's how you respond to Mm. what goes on that is the difference between being a leader in your own life and allowing somebody else to be the leader because you always have to make that decision again you either choose to allow someone to lead you or you decide you are the leader but you will respond to somebody out of respect for the role that they're in or the particular part they're playing in whatever you're doing at that point in time. And I think when we actually recognise that we have to lead ourselves first and we are truly responsible for our thoughts, our feelings and therefore our actions, that is when we put ourselves right in that driving seat and we make decisions from that position. Yeah, I love that idea of responding, Leslie. You know, I often talk about this with my clients. You know, that knee-jerk reaction, you won't always be your best in that moment. The fact that you can take a pause, reflect on what just happened, and then respond appropriately does take practice. We talked earlier about experience coming into it and age. I think that really does help. Um, But we can certainly pass on that um, that advice to to the younger generations of leaders that are coming through um, to to make sure that they're setting themselves up for success, giving themselves that time. You know, if I I think of a a favourite coach of mine, Nancy Klein, you know, and her time to think um, sort of uh, model or, you know, and that thinking environment she talks about creating. It's all about asking one question and then letting the coaches 
thoughts just come from there. I often talk about my coaching as as thought partnership for, for senior leaders because they just don't get any time to think about anything. Yeah. You know, so being able to give yourself time, train yourself not to react in the instant. You know, I'll 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 think about, you know, if I get an email that really annoys me, it would be so easy just to send the reaction immediately. <laughs> yeah. Keep that yeah. Yeah. that'll tell yeah. you <laughs> and well, i have done that absolutely yeah yeah it's no help to anybody no. so often well always now when i get something that comes in and it riles me i'll type up the response and i'll leave it in drafts i if it's uh, in the morning until later that day when lots of other things have happened and I've forgotten about it and I'll go back to it more rationally or overnight and come back to it in the morning and then send it, you know, and, and it, it's so helpful. And it's not that, that I'm super fiery or anything like that, but I do want to have that considered response. Yeah. And I am super fiery. So I have had to learn to not be and I think for me, it was hearing somebody be, you know, basically saying, actually, I am going to be fully responsible for how I feel about something. I'm mm. not going to let somebody else decide ultimately how I'm going to feel. And I remember that conversation now so well that, you know, for example, why I read it, I don't know because it winds me up, but I read the Daily Mail online. <laughs> and the Daily Mail Online is a really, it, it, it is so separate from the published newspaper, so badly written, so written to have, you know, keyboard warriors, etc. Yeah. Um, and I always go and look at the comments on, you know, certain, on new, certain news articles. And I used to be one of those, you know, would you know, reply back to comments, and, blah, 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 blah. but actually I don't do it anymore. I'm thinking, why am I, why am I allowing somebody else to decide how I'm going to respond to something they're making me react i'm not going mm. to react because it's not serving any purpose and that has sat really really well mm. with me and taught me you know a phrase and i'm sure i must have heard it somewhere or i have kind of um twisted slightly and made it my own mm. but giving myself the grace of space has yeah. been so so game changing for me to be able to sit back and to assess how I'm feeling about something and to think well can I impact on what is happening there can I actually do anything about it is there any point in firing off an email to my MP because I'm not happy about yet another bad decision being taken by the government no because he's just going to come back with the usual party line approach basically so i think it is about being fully invested in recognizing that leadership of yourself means everything else you can look at with far less serious regard you can take it mm. far less personally and when you take it less personally because we only react when we take things personally, exactly. we respond from a completely different position. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel now, I, you know, my, my children are quite surprised at me because, you know, something will happen. And I'll say, oh, mum, we really thought you were going to shout at us. Oh, good God. You know, I'm not really happy that you've got that score in your test, but I think you've learned from it. I think you being worried about it probably is going to be a bigger lesson the next time around you're going to do a little bit more revision maybe and I think it's because I now really do recognize the importance of my own internal conversation mm. and actually ensuring it's not a self-defeating conversation so it is a game and I can't you know and I'm kind of aware but I look at it in the approach of it being fun because if it's not fun you know, yet again, we have choices. We have choices to accept what's not fun. 
and to reason out why we are doing what we are doing, but make the decision. Make the decision. I am doing this because, right. Once mm -hmm. you've made that decision, let that decision sit with you as well as it possibly can, whilst making another decision that over time to change what you're doing. And I think very often people like to think they have no choice, they have no decision. If that is the case, when did you give somebody else the ability to make that decision for you? And exactly. I think that was game changing for me when I realised that. I love that because so many of us hand over the reins of our lives to somebody else. And, um, you know, I'm not a control freak, but I am going to use the term taking back control and making those decisions. You do have a choice, even when you don't think you do. You know, I have a job, I have to earn money, so therefore I can't give up the job. If you hate the job, do something about it. I'm not telling you to resign there and then and then be out of work whilst you're looking for another job. Yes, you have to ride the storm for a little bit whilst you're finding the other job, but um, you're the one that can make that commitment to take action. You know, this is just a simple example, but yeah. there is always a choice. Yeah. You know, even when you say, you know, oh, financially, I can't afford to give up this job not asking you to do that we're asking you to make a considered decision about how you approach that transition and change and the choice is yours yeah. and what happens then you get fire in your belly again you know yeah. once you actually go oh god you're right do you know i've been allowing them to make that decision for me i've been mm -hmm. allowing circumstances to make that decision for me no, I can't leave my job at the moment. But what I can do is I can sharpen up my CV. I can get my references refreshed. I can start putting my CV out there. I can start exploring what's going on. And all of a sudden, because you've taken back control, that job that you absolutely hate, actually, it's okay. Because it's keeping you financially safe whilst you're going off and exploring well what is it i really want to be doing next mm -hmm. and i think that when we when we have that fire in our belly that is when the greatest change happens because we're taking as you've said we're taking back that control and we mm -hmm. recognize we don't have to be saddled with the situation that we are in and I think for, for a lot of people, we allow that downward pressure from somebody else to control what we're doing rather than really personally uprising and responding, not mm. reacting, not I hate my job, I hate my life, blah, blah. Actually go, mm, this is not where I want to be. This is not how I imagined I'd be spending my 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever it's going to be. What did I imagine I was going to do? What's stopping me? What is mm. it stopping me from taking those steps? What do I really need to do in order to take those steps? What am I scared of? And am I more scared of not taking those steps? Or am I more scared of looking back in five years time, still doing the same things I didn't like because somebody else was telling me I didn't, I, what I should be doing, basically. Yeah. And I know for me, it is always the case of, I don't want to look back with regret. Yes, I've had to do things along the way. I've had to ride, you know, economic waves, et cetera, et cetera. But at each step of the way, I've tried to be the one that was in control, be the one that was informed, be the one that made the decisions. Because then where I've got to is down to me. Where I haven't got to is down to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame you know, other people, other circumstances. Because in every negative situation, there's always people that thrive. And mm -hmm. I always choose to want to be one of those people that thrive rather than sitting there waiting for a knight in shining armour who doesn't exist to actually come and save me. Because if you do that, you essentially give up. 
you yeah. hand over control to somebody else. You hand over that leadership to somebody else. And I never, ever want somebody else to have control over me. Mm. So I think that, that that is my kind of dominating life force, essentially, is doing all I can do to help myself. And that is how I approach, you know, my game of life, my game of leadership. But, that, but the biggest thing is that leadership now is my own personal self-leadership. Yeah, absolutely, Leslie. And you are definitely the player on your own chessboard in your own game of leadership and your own knight in shining armour. Yeah. We have to be that for yeah. ourselves absolutely. because, you know, nobody cares about your personal development and your personal journey, your personal leadership more than you do. Absolutely, 100%. Totally agree with you, Paula. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh, that's been such a fascinating conversation. Once again, a completely different change uh, or take, rather, on, on game and leadership together. Thank you so much, Leslie. Absolutely fascinating. And um, I can't wait to, to listen to it back again, because I know there were lots of little gems in there for, for people to take away that may well support them in their own leadership journey in terms of you know taking that control um and this this always comes up people are getting used to me saying this now but being the master of your own destiny it's so important we've master. got choices we might not be able to jump from a to d right now we may have to go through b and c on the way but you will get there if you dedicate yourself to it and you yeah. make those right choices for yourselves. Yeah, so wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm delighted to say we've got you again for one more episode next time. So thank you for today, Leslie, so much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Really enjoyed it as well. Speak to you soon. Cheers. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Game of Leadership, the podcast for curious leaders. I always think the game episode is one of my favourites because we get a real insight to our guests' take on their ideas of how games and leadership fit together. Every one of them is different and um, just when I think there isn't another take that we haven't thought of or covered, one of our guests comes up with something totally different and unique. It's really exciting. Look, now it's your turn. See what you think, see what resonated with you most. And as always, I encourage you to reflect on what you've heard and see what that might mean for your leadership moving forwards. I'm Paula Eddy Wilcox, and this is Game of Leadership, the podcast for curious leaders. I really look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye for now. <laughs>